All right, so now I want you to sit back, relax, and welcome to our stage, Buffalo Bill Cody. I am about to take the back trail through the Old West, a West that I knew and loved. All my life it has been my pleasure to show its marvels, its beauties, its possibilities to those who were seeing it for the first time. And going over that ground with the eyes of memory is an even greater pleasure still. And if in following me through these scenes of the old times and listening to my campfire stories about the Indians and the buffalo, the stagecoach and the Pony Express, your interest in this vast land of my youth should be awakened, then I shall feel richly repaid. In my later years, I often brought the West to the East, sometimes under a sideshow tent, but more often in an open air arena. But my own debut upon the world stage occurred on February 26th, 1846. I was born William Frederick Cody on a small farm in LeClaire, Iowa. And it was there that I spent the uh, first five or six years of my life. Looking back at my childhood days, you know, the spirit of adventure often used to get me into mischief. And I sometimes wonder why I didn't ooh, get drowned, swim in some wild stream, or break my neck of stealing apples from neighbor's orchards. But somehow, I survived. <laughs> and although it would be another 20 years before I'd get the famous nickname of Buffalo Bill, I believe that my love of hunting and scouting and for life on the plains in general was a result of that early childhood experience. Well, about uh, two months after I was born, the Donner Party began its ill-fated journey to California. Now, you all know that story, I'm sure. April 1846, a group of 87 immigrants, led by the Illinois farmer George Donner, set out for California with high hopes. But an early snow that winter made crossing the Sierra Nevada mountains impossible. And soon they were immobilized and had to resort to cannibalism to survive. Well, by 1852, the tragedy of the Donner Party had entered into Western lore, but it had not stopped the movement west. No oh, imaginations were being stirred up by the California gold rush, and in the spring of that year, my father disposed of our little farm in Kansas, and we took our departure for California. Well, we got as far as Kansas. In Kansas, he established a trading post at Salt Creek Valley about four miles from the Kickapoo Indian Agency. Now, the Kickapoos were very friendly Indians. And I spent a lot of time about around them and learning their ways and looking about. And when father wasn't busy trading with the Kickapoos, he and I were hard at the task of cutting and hauling logs to make a dwelling for our family. Well, I was only 11 years old when my father died in that log cabin we built. Suddenly, I was the man of the family, and I determined that I should be the breadwinner. Well, the great freighting firm of Russell, Majors, and Waddell was then sending its wagon trains out from the plains, uh, carrying supplies to all the soldiers at the frontier forts. I watched these preparations with great excitement. Oh, the, the, the boat trains were just wonderful each of them with its own yoke of oxen and a, a wagon master, extra hands, bull whackers, and a caviar driver following behind to round up any stray cattle that fell past the back of the wagon train. Well, I determined I ought to have a share in this. So I went to Mr. Majors, and I asked him for a job. Now, he had known my father, so I told him of our situation and that I needed the work to support my mother and my family. You're only a boy, Billy, he said. What can you do? Well, I said, I, I can uh, ride a horse as well as a man. I can uh, herd the extra cattle that follow behind. Well, he agreed I could do this and agreed to hire me. 
I was to receive a man's wages, $40 a month. But before I could go to work for Mr. Majors, he gave me an oath that all of his employees had to take. We, the undersigned, wagon masters, assistants, teamsters, and other employees of the firm of Russell, Majors, and Waddell, do hereby affirm that we will not swear, drink whiskey, play cards, or be cruel to dumb beasts in any way, shape, or form, so help me God. I signed it with my mark, for I could not write then. And we all did our best to uh, live up to the provisions of that oath, although I will admit that the uh, profanity clause was occasionally violated, <laughs> especially by some of those hard-swearing bullwhackers. But Fort Leavenworth at that time was full of warlike preparations. A number of troops were being assembled to send out west against the Mormons in the Utah Territory, and uh, many of the soldiers had already be been sent ahead. My first job was to accompany a herd of cattle that was destined to become beef for those soldiers. Frank and Bill McCarthy, the heads of our outfit, were your uh, typical Westerners, rough, courageous, and with lots of experience on the frontier. Oh, the trip was exciting for everybody, but uh, especially for me, as there was something new to be seen at every turn of the road. <laughs> Camp life was difficult. You know, the bacon was often rusty and uh, flour moldy. But the hard work gave you a big appetite. And a plainsman learns not to be particular. Well, the uh, trip went smoothly enough until we reached Plum Creek, about 35 miles past uh, Fort Kearney. The uh, cattle had wandered off to graze. We had had a, a morning drive and were nooning at Plum Creek. They were grazing across the prairie, and most of the men had climbed under the mess wagon and were taking a nap while the cooks were making the dinner. All of a sudden, there was a sharp bang, 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 and a thunder of hooves. Indians, cried Bill McCarthy. They shot the herders and stampeded the cattle. Make a run for the river boys and use that bank for a breastwork. Well, when I saw how coolly those McCarthy brothers conducted themselves, I just thought we would stand the Indians off, as the saying goes. But we were there only a short time before Frank McCarthy told our little band, well, boys, the longer we're corralled, the worse it'll be for us. Let's stick together and make our way back to Fort Kearney by wading in that river. Well, as I said, this was going to be more than a 35-mile hike. Nevertheless, we all agreed it was the best plan, and we obeyed orders quickly. It was a long, wearying journey. But we all knew that uh, our lives depended on keeping very quiet and using that riverbed for protection. Every so often, we had to cross the stream, which was knee high to the other men, but well nigh chest high to me, being the smallest and the youngest of our group. And gradually, I fell behind, dog tired, dragging one step after another, but still clinging to my old Mississippi Jagger rifle. Well, eventually, night fell. And by then, the other men were almost out of earshot. Gradually, the moon rose dead ahead of me, and I happened to look up at it. Painted boldly across its face was the figure of an Indian. There could be no confusing him. He was wearing the war bonnet of the Sioux, and at his shoulder was a rifle pointed at the riverbed below me. Well, I knew that in one more second he would drop one of my friends, so I instantly aimed my gun and fired. Well, the shot rang out loud in the night air, and it was followed by a war whoop. Next thing you know, about six feet of dead Indian brave came tumbling down into that water. Well, I was not only scared, I was overcome by amazement. I, I could hardly realize what I had done. And while I stood there, thus bewildered, the other members of our party, having heard the gunshot and the war whoop, came rushing back. What is it, whispered Frank McCarthy. Who fired that shot? I did, I said, and whatever it is, it's down in the water. <laughs> About this time, Bill McCarthy, who had approached nearer the others and almost tripped over the corpse, 
ran up and said, hey, little Billy has killed an Indian all by himself. Well, as I was still not more than 11 years of age, this created quite a stir among the other members of our party. However, not wanting to meet any of the deceased gentleman's friends, we pushed on even faster for Fort Kearney, which we finally made about daylight. Once there, we were given food, sent to bed, while the troopers were sent out to recover our cattle. Well, by the time we got home, News of my exploit had been noised about, and right or wrong, I had become the envy of all the boys in the neighborhood. Next thing you know, the Leavenworth Times sent out a reporter to get the full story of my adventure. And after that, I saw my name in the newspaper for the first time in my life as the youngest Indian slayer on the plains. Uh, I was not proud of having killed another human being. But I am candid enough to admit that I was much elated by the notoriety. Let me just say that I am and always have been a friend to the Indian. I've sympathized with his struggle to hold on to this country that was his by right of birth. But I have also contended that in such a nation as the United States, a march of civilization is inevitable. And nine times out of 10, when there is trouble between the white man and the Indian, the white man is responsible. The Indian expects a man to keep his word. He cannot understand how a person could lie, because most of them would as soon cut off their own leg as tell a lie. No, first consideration in the so-called management of Indians is that when you promise him anything, you have to keep your word. Break it, and the trouble commences at once. Now, in 1885, when Sitting Bull was traveling with the Wild West Show, I gave one reporter a thumbnail sketch of the Sioux War as I saw it, attributing Sitting Bull's hostility towards the United States as a defense of his home. Now, to some people, this is controversial, but Gold seekers had invaded the Black Hills. And when the Indians saw that the government wasn't going to be able to defend them, they decided it was high time to do it themselves. Oh, yeah, the Washington bureaucracy did everything they thought they could, but to no avail. A white man would not be turned back once they had smelled gold in Dumdar Hills. In my own dealings with the Indians, I've always tried to understand them, and I think they understood me. In times of war, we tried to kill each other. And in times of peace, we were friends. And I've always been able to do more with the Indians than most white men. I think the reason I was successful in getting so many Indians to travel with Wild West Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show was because they did understand me, and I understood them and respected their way of life. Some critics, they were, uh, they were not happy with the fact that I hired Indians to be in Buffalo Bill's Wild West, especially when we were reenacting Custer's last rally and the fight at the Little Bighorn. But as far as I could tell, the uh, only surviving witnesses of that battle were the Indians. <coughs> and more importantly, there is no law in this land, which prevents an Indian from earning his living, making money like any other man. And nor should there be, in my opinion. Well, given my experience with the McCarthy brothers, I was now convinced that I was destined for a life on the plains. <laughs> so once again, I went to Mr. Majors and I asked him for a job. This time he said, well, you seem to have gotten yourself a reputation as a frontiersman, Billy. I guess I'll have to give you another chance. He turned me over to Lou Simpson, who was the uh, boss of another wagon train heading out with supplies for the troops. And Simpson seemed happy to have me, too. It was the first of many trips I made with him. Among other things, the summer of 1858, we spent at Fort Laramie, an old frontier post dead in the heart of Indian country. 
Oh, no. Laramie had been established by a fur trading company, but in 1840 or thereabouts, the government bought it and turned it into a frontier fort. Well, it had become the most celebrated gathering spot of the plains. Three or 4,000 Sioux, Arapaho, and uh, Cheyenne were encamped nearby, and most of them spent much of their time in the fort. The most famous Indian councils were held there, and there, too, came the most celebrated Indian fighters, men whose names I had long known, but uh, never dared hope I would have a chance to see. Kit Carson, Jim Bridger, and other celebrated hunters, trappers, and Indian fighters were as common around that post as our bankers on Wall Street. All of them fascinated me, but especially Carson, a small, quiet, dapper man who everyone held in profound respect. I would watch him for hours, talking to the Indians in the sign language. Without saying a word, they would hold long conversations, tell stories, inquire about game and trails, and discuss pretty much everything that men find worth discussing. <laughs> now, I was uh, very desirous of mastering this mysterious medium of speech. In fact, I. Uh, entered my education in it with much more enthusiasm than I ever devoted to the three R's. But I would also join in the uh, Indian children in their games. And in this way, I got myself a fair working knowledge of the Sioux spoken language. This acquaintance I formed was to save my life and my scalp later on as a scout. Well, in January of uh, 59, Simpson was finally ordered back to Missouri. And I was a rich boy by the time I got home with over $1,000 to turn over to my mother just as soon as I should draw my pay. <laughs> well, after a joyful reunion, I hitched up a pair of ponies, and I drove her over to witness this pleasing ceremony. Everything went fine, too, until we were coming home, and then I noticed that she was sobbing. And I was greatly concerned, for this seemed to me no occasion for tears. I asked her what was the matter, and she said, you couldn't even write your name, Billy. You couldn't sign the payroll. To think that a son of mine cannot so much as write his own name. Well, I thought that over all the way home. And I determined never happen again. Mr. Majors, in his uh, book, 70 Years on the Frontier, relates how on every wagon bed and wagon sheet, on every tree and barn door, he found the name William F. Cody in a large, uncertain scrawl. <laughs> These were my writing lessons, and I took them daily until I had my signature plastered over the whole of Salt Creek Valley. <laughs> I went to school for a while after that, but I could never resist the call of the trail. Well, soon, the Pikes Peak Gold Rush had swept me away with it. And with another boy who knew as little of gold mining as I did, we hired on as bull whackers for a bull train heading for Denver, which is then called Aurora. By the time we reached the gold country, we each had $50 apiece. And we spent it on an elaborate outfit. But you know, by that point, there was no gold to be found except with expensive machinery. So strapped, we hired on as timber cutters, a job which lasted until we realized it would take us both a full week to cut a single tree. <laughs> so then we signed on as bullwhackers again. And with the money we made from that, we were able to go home. But every time I would return home, I would get a new, and I always thought, better idea of how I could make a fortune for me and my family. <laughs> and soon I had sampled a broad cloth of occupations, from timber cutter, gold miner, and fur trapper to the more familiar bull whacker and caviar driver. Oh, I was possessed of an appetite for adventure. And I was never long in finding. Well, in April 1860, that same firm of Russell, Majors, and Waddell organized the wonderful Pony Express, the most 
picturesque messenger service this country has ever seen. The route was from St. Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento, California, a distance of 2,000 miles, across the plains over two great mountain ranges and through a dreary stretch of sagebrush and alkali desert that in 1863, President Lincoln christened the state of Nevada. <laughs> well, this was a life that appealed to me. Oh, the, the firm had been busy for some time selecting the best ponies and the wiriest, lightest, most experienced riders. And I struck for a job. Now, I was pretty young in years. But I had a reputation by then as coming safe out of dangerous situations. And so I was hired at the tender age of 15. The system was really, it was a relay race against time. They had stations built at 15 mile intervals. And at the beginning, each rider was expected to cover three of these stations with a change of horses at each one. So you were expected to ride 45 miles a day. Well, our equipment was the very lightest to keep the weight down. The uh, messages were written on the thinnest paper to be found, tissue paper, really, wrapped up in oiled silk. And these we carried in a waterproof pouch called a mochillo, which we slung under our arms. The pay for each rider was $100 to $125 a day. But once it was announced that the further a man rode, the greater would be his pay. This put a little extra speed and endurance into us. <laughs> First trip of the Pony Express was made in 10 days, an average of 200 miles a day. But we soon began stretching our rides, and it shortened that time down to eight days. Stretching my own route, found myself riding well into the foothills of the Rockies. Oh. Now, this part of the country was infested by hostile Indians and road agents, and I never knew when I set out when I should reach my destination or if I should ever reach it at all. One day, I rode into the station at Three Crossings only to find that my relief had been killed in a drunken row the night before. Well, there was no time to think it over. There was nobody to take his place, so selecting a fresh pony from the stables, I was soon on my way. I reached my new destination at uh, Rocky Ridge on time, and then turning around, came all the way back to my original starting point at Red Buttes. That ride, round trip, was over 300 miles. It was not the record, but it was a good ride. <laughs> now, because I believe that a man ought to get credit for a job well done, I'm going to read you the names of the men who had the top three rides of the Pony Express. The longest Pony Express ride is credited to Pony Bob Haslam during the Paiute Indian War right in neighboring Nevada. And that was 380 miles. Second was Howard R. Egan with a run of 330 miles. And the third longest Pony Express ride was William F. Cody's. 322 miles in 21 hours and 40 minutes, using a total of 21 horses. <laughs> now, some people have suggested I never rode with the Pony Express due to my age, since much of their advertising said they were hiring men 20 years old and older. But the average age of the Pony Express rider was only 18. Now, that is still a far cry from my 15 years. But in Mr. Major's aforementioned book, you will find the following. Among the most noted and daring riders of the Pony Express was the Right Honorable William F. Cody, better known today as Buffalo Bill. Could anything? be clearer or more conclusive than that. <laughs> oh, I wrote my mom, and I told her how much I liked the life. She replied, begging me to give it up as it would surely kill me. <laughs> you know, she was right about that, too. 15 miles an hour on a horseback would pretty soon just shake a man all to pieces. <laughs> Few riders, if any, could stand it for any great length of time, but uh, I stuck to it. Until hearing that my ma was sick, I gave it up and went back to the old home. Well, on the 23rd day of December, 1863, 
my mother passed away. Her life had been a hard one, but she had borne up bravely, never complaining, her only thoughts being for her children and the sufferings that were visited on them. Well, thus ended my boyhood on the plains. But it has been my great privilege to also spend my early adult years working on the frontier as a buffalo hunter for the Kansas Pacific Railroad and as a scout for the U.S. Cavalry. Oh, there is where I met and served with commanders such as Sherman and Sheridan, Nelson Miles and George Armstrong Custer, men who would be leaders in any army, in any age. There is where I knew and helped fight some of the most notable Indian warriors, honorable men, such as Red Cloud and, of course, Sitting Bull, who later became my friend and traveled with the Wild West Show. And there is where the title of Buffalo Bill was first conferred on me by the road hands. The western end of the Kansas Pacific Railroad was right in the heart of Buffalo country. 1,200 men were working on the construction of that railroad. But the Indians were making it very difficult to obtain fresh meat for the hands. So the company decided to engage expert hunters to kill buffaloes. Well, having heard of my experience, the Goddard brothers, who held the contract for feeding the men, made me a good offer. They were going to pay me $500 a month. And in return, I agreed to supply them with all the meat they needed. Now, this would amount to about 12 buffaloes a day, as only the hump and the hind quarters were utilized. Well, soon I had gained a, quite a good reputation. And it was not long after that that I had my celebrated buffalo shooting contest with Billy Comstock, a well-known interpreter and guide. Now, Comstock was chief of scouts at Fort Wallace. But he also had a reputation as being a very successful buffalo hunter. And we had both laid claim to the title of Buffalo Bill. So it was arranged that we should have a contest where the man who shot the most buffaloes uh, by horseback would be declared the winner. The uh, winnings would be $500, and you would also get the uh, title of champion buffalo hunter on the plains. Well, this shooting match had been well advertised. And there was an excursion party of about 100 ladies and gentlemen who came all the way from St. Louis on an excursion train just to see this sport. Well, when 8 o'clock arrived, I felt fairly confident that I had an advantage over Comstock for two reasons. First, I had the best buffalo pony in the country, my old brigham. Second, I was using what was called a needle gun. It was a 50 caliber Springfield breech loading rifle. And uh, I had nicknamed it Lucretia Borgia. <laughs> now, Comstock's Henry repeating rifle could fire more rapidly than my weapon. But I felt certain that his did not carry enough powder and lead to equal my gun. Well, 8 o'clock, we spotted the herd, and we dashed off. When they separated, Comstock took the left-hand bunch and I the right. My great forte in hunting buffaloes was to get them running in a circle. I do this by riding at the front of the herd and shoot the leaders. This would force the other brutes to the left, and old Brigham and I would follow them and continue shooting the leaders, and pretty soon we had them going round and round. Well, I shot them thick and fast that day until I had a total of 38 buffalo. Comstock was chasing his herd, so he managed to get 23, but they were all in a straight line over a three-mile distance. Well, when the results of that first run were announced, the excursion party laid out some champagne. And it proved to be a very good drink on the Kansas prairie. And a buffalo hunter proved to be an excellent man to dispose of it. <laughs> Well, after a short rest, we spied another herd and dashed off into that. Soon I had 18 buffalo, and Comstock had 14. Well, once again, the party approached and 
Champagne flowed, and after a short luncheon, we saw third herd, and we made our third run. So by now, I felt that I had a pretty good lead, and I could afford to give a little extra exhibition of my skills. So I told the ladies from St. Louis that on this run, I would ride without saddle and bridle. Oh, one fair lady tried to talk me out of it. But I said, why, ma'am, it's nothing at all. I have done it many a time, and old Brigham knows just as well as I what I am doing, and sometimes a good deal better. So, put my saddle and my bridle down by the wagons, we dashed bareback into that herd. Well, I soon had 13 more laid out, the last one of which I had driven straight at the wagons. And you should have seen some of those fair creatures looked close to fainting when they saw a massive buffalo driving right at them. But I stopped him before he'd gotten 50 yards close to them. Well, the afternoon was getting long. Comstock and his backers were giving up all hope of catching me. And so with a final total of 69 buffalo for me and 46 buffalo for Comstock, I was declared the winner. And Champion Buffalo Hunter of the Plains. In 18 months, while I was engaged as a hunter for the Kansas Pacific Railroad, I shot 4,280 buffalo. And the railroad hands came up with this little jingle. Buffalo Bill, Buffalo Bill, always aims and shoots to kill, never misses, never will. And the railroad pays his buffalo bill. <laughs> I know there are a lot of folks who don't approve of that enterprise. There may be some here tonight, but uh, that nickname has stuck with me ever since. And I have never been ashamed of it. Well, in May 1868, construction of the Kansas Pacific Railroad had reached as far as Sheridan. So construction was abandoned for the time being, and my services as a buffalo hunter were no longer required. However, scouts and guides for the US Cavalry were in great demand. So I decided to try my hand at that calling. Now, I did not wish to kill my faithful old Brigham with the rigors of a scouting campaign. But I had no place to leave him. So at the suggestion of several of my friends, all of whom wanted him, I put him up at a raffle. 10 chances of $30 a piece. Ike Bonham, who won him, took him to Wyandotte, Kansas, where he soon added some fresh laurels to his already shining wreath. In the crowning tournament, he was able to outdistance all the other entrants in a 14-mile run and earned $250 for his new owner, who had been laughed at for entering such an unprepossessing animal. I lost track of him after that. But many years later, while I was in Memphis with the Wild West, I met a, a Mr. Wilcox, who had been superintendent of construction on the Kansas Pacific Railroad. And he said that he had Brigham. Well, I rode out to his place to see my faithful old friend. And I, I believe he recognized me as I put my arms around his neck and caressed him like a long lost child. <laughs> well, it is one thing to have the uh, road hand on the railroad and the cavalrymen singing your praises. It is quite another thing to go into a theater to try to act out a play about yourself. That I, a rough old scout who had never seen more than 20 or so theatrical productions in my life, should even consider going on the stage was ridiculous in the extreme. I mean, you might as well try to make an actor out of a government mule. But in 1869, a writer by the name of Ned Buntline came out to the frontier looking for a scout he could write about. Well, rumor has it, Wild Bill Hickok was in a churlish mood that summer. And Frank North was too shy and hated publicity. So that left me. And I gave Buntline enough stories about life on the plains to 
Fill a dime novel. Well, next thing you know, that little book had been turned into a play in New York. And I was kind of curious to see how I would look when represented by someone else on a Broadway stage. So naturally, I was there for the opening night in a private box that Buttline had reserved for me. Well, when that audience found out that the real Buffalo Bill was present, oh, they gave several cheers between acts and called me on stage to make a speech. For I knew it was happening. I found myself standing in front of that audience not knowing what to say. I made a desperate effort. Several words escaped, but what they were I couldn't tell you for the life of me because I don't remember. And nor could anyone else in that theater because I mumbled so badly. <laughs> oh, well. Well, finally, I just beat a hasty retreat, duty calling me back out west. <laughs> but in 1872, the Indians had grown rather quiet. In army life without excitement, even though we still did a little bit of scouting, was never very interesting to me. So when Buttline called me and gave me a chance to come back and try my fortunes as an actor in that uh, drama about myself, I accept. Now I did some with I did so with some misgivings, naturally. I mean, chasing make-believe Indians across a stage is very different from tracking the real thing out on the plains. See, I knew the Western Indians' ways. I was totally unfamiliar with the stage Indian. And the thought of standing in front of an audience as they gaped at me over the footlights still made me shudder. But that first year was rather prosperous, <laughs> as was the second when Wild Bill joined us to play in the hodgepodge that Buttline had written for us. And by the third year, I'd organized a show of my own with a more realistic storyline. And uh, this toured off and on for the next 10 years, and this time with real Indians in it. First, I believe, whoever performed on a stage. Well, it was because of this. Uh, Oh, unexpected success, and of course, my own interest in the West, that I first decided to bring the West to the East in the medium of an exhibition. You couldn't do that on a stage or even under a circus big top. They were just too small to really give any kind of a, an impression of what Western life was like. Only in an arena where horses could be ridden at full gallop lassoes thrown and guns and pistols fired into the air, could such a thing be accomplished without frightening an audience half to death? Now, for my grand entrance, I created a spectacle comprised of the most picturesque elements of Western life. First came the Indians, Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho leading the charge in war paint and feathers. Oh, they shrieked their war hoops and waved their weapons in the air in a manner to inspire both fear and admiration. Next came the cowboys and the cavalry, all clad exactly as they had been during their campaigns against the Indians during the Plains Wars. And lumbering along in the rear were the stagecoaches, covered wagons, which carried settlers out west in those days before the railroad made the journey easy and pleasant. Then I would ride out to the front of this procession, mounted on a white horse, and lift my hat and bow. Then in a booming voice, I would announce to the tenderfoot audience gathered around on bleachers and benches, ladies and gentlemen, permit me to introduce to you Buffalo Bill's Wild West and Congress of Rough Riders of the World. I had no idea how successful this venture was going to be when it first occurred to me. But I guess audiences enjoyed the spectacle because they flocked to see it. Oh, we played in all the principal cities of the country and everywhere. The novelty of the exhibition drew great crowds. Eventually, I added other expert horsemen from around the world, gauchos, vaqueros, Arabs, even Cossacks from the Russian steppes. But I still paid particular attention to the Western program of the entertainment, making sure that it was accurate in every detail. The uh, wigwam village, 
the Indian war dance, the song of the great spirit as it was chanted out on the plains, all these were accurately depicted. And this was not an easy thing to do. But it had always been my goal in trying to show people the West, to show it as it truly was. Well, we toured successfully for three years. And then one day, an Englishman, whose name I never really knew, came up to me and said, that is a wonderful performance. Now, here in America, of course, it is met with great appreciation. But you have no idea what a sensation it would cause in the old world, where such things are just unheard of. A few days after that, I received a uh, letter out of the blue from a well-known American author who had also recognized the Wild West's potential for overseas validation. Dear Mr. Cody, I have seen your Wild West show two days in succession and enjoyed it thoroughly. It brought vividly back the breezy wildlife of the Great Plains and Rocky Mountains when I was a cub reporter in Virginia City. And it stirred me like a war song. Every detail to that show is genuine. Now, it is often said on the other side of the pond that none of the exhibitions which we send to England are purely and distinctly American. Well, if you will take the Wild West show over there, I believe you can remove that reproach. Truly yours, Mark Twain. All this set me to think. In a few days, I had decided that Europe ought to have an opportunity to study America at first hand. And so chartering the steamship state of Nebraska, I loaded my cowboys and Indians, horses and buffaloes, stagecoaches and covered wagons all on board, and we set off for another continent. <laughs> there we were to play for the Queen of England for her golden jubilee, and we met all the crowned heads of England. Well, this has been the trip of a lifetime. And I must say, no easy task to take such a large operation overseas to unfamiliar countries. Now, I know of no other manager who would have even attempted it, just given the sheer size of our spectacle. But when I got home, I was happy to receive another letter. Dear sir, in common with all your countrymen, I want you to know that I am proud of your success. So far as I can make out, you have been modest, graceful, and dignified in all you have done to illustrate the history of civilization on this continent. I am especially pleased with the compliment paid you by the Prince of Wales, who consented to ride with you in the Deadwood coach while it was attacked by Indians and rescued by cowboys. Such things did occur in our days, but of course they never will again. Now, if you have caught one epoch of this country's history and have illustrated it in the very heart of, civil, of the modern world, London, and I want you to feel that on this side of the water, we appreciate it. The presence of Queen Victoria, the beautiful Princess of Wales, the Prince, and the British public are marks of favor, which reflect back on America sparks of light, illuminating many a house and cabin in the land where once you guided me honestly and faithfully. Sincerely, your friend, William Tecumseh Sherman. Well, this drama must end. Days, years, and centuries follow fast. Even the drama of civilization must have an end. I've now come to the end of my story. It is the story of the great West that was. The buffalo are gone, at least in the great numbers that we first witnessed them. Gone is the stagecoach, whose progress the buffalo's pilgrimage often used to interrupt. And gone is the Pony Express, whose marvelous efficiency 
could compete with the wind, but not with the harnessed lightning flashed over telegraph wires. But the Old West, with its strong characters, stern battles, and long stretches of loneliness, this can never be blotted from my mind. And nor can it, I hope, be blotted from the memory of the American people. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. If any of you have any questions, I will try to answer them for you tonight. Oh, way up there in the balcony, wow. Yes, you're not holding a rifle, are you? All right. Well, it was right at, we had had a miserable time in uh, New Orleans. Our show had been canceled, it was about 1888. And fortunately for us, her uh, employer also, at that point, had to close shop. So she actually came to see us and asked for a job. I, I told her, and I, you know, it was probably a big mistake, I told her I thought I had enough shooting axe in the show. So I said no initially. But eventually, she and uh, Frank Butler were available, and I hired them the year after that. Uh, she performed with me for 17 years. Now, the Wild West continued, went for 30 years. But she was with us for almost half of that time. And she was also responsible for the addition of another important element in the Wild West. The gentleman who was only with me for one year, but the man who gave her her nickname of Little Sure Shot, that was Sitting Bull. So we were trying to convince Sitting Bull to join the Wild West. And eventually, our, our um, publicist, John Burke, saw a photograph of Sitting Bull with Annie Oakley. And as it turned out, Sitting Bull had seen her in St. Paul, Minnesota, just doing an exhibition of shooting, and had nicknamed her Little Sure Shot and adopted her as a tribal daughter. Well, Burke jumped on this and said, if you want, you can see little Annie Oakley every day. Just come and perform with us. And for a year, Sitting Bull joined the Wild West show and traveled with us. Yes. Oh, I had both. <laughs> yes, my wife Louisa and I, we had four children, uh, two of which passed away, fortunately. Um, and I'm sure those of you who uh, read the New York newspapers know that uh, not all of the times we had together were happy ones. But uh, happy to say we're still together, despite uh, an appearance in divorce court, which is a great deal different than appearing on a stage or in an open air arena. So, <laughs> Yes. They were used for meat that day. They actually dragged them away from meat. And I do, I know that uh, there was a lot of buffalo that went unused in that time. Um, I'm happy to tell you that um, two things occurred after that. Um, I think that it sounds like a large number, but. 4,000 buffalo was a, unfortunately just a drop in the bucket for the number of buffalo that were actually killed during that time. And not only by the railroads, but also by uh, fur trappers who were out there collecting buffalo robes and things like that. And we were not as good at utilizing all parts of the buffalo the way the Indian was. But interest in the West created interest in the buffalo. And I was very happy about the fact that uh, when the herd had been reduced to about 9,000, it had gotten very low, we actually started to domesticate our own buffalo. I, I sold a buffalo to the zoo in London. And uh, we, would, we raised buffalo and increased the number of buffalo that had survived. So it's a, it's a small thing that we were able to do. But I'm, I'm glad to see the buffalo is once again out on the range. Other questions? Yes. With your experience with the Pony Express, you mentioned three times the amount of pay that you 
That is an excellent question. I have no idea. I know that it was based on the size of the message in much the same way that later telegraphs would charge. But I do not know. I, I, they didn't trust a 15-year-old to collect the, the fare for that message. They just handed me the pouch and sent me on my way. But that is an excellent question. Um, I think that they should know that it was a great challenge at that time to expand uh, civilization and to make it, make it possible for settlers to go and live in the West. I think they should also know that there were uh, a great many mistakes that were made due to misunderstanding with other people. Um, I think we probably could have done a, a much better job if we had, uh, there was no reason not to live up to our, our promises. Um, but you know, once you introduce a, a dollar or a chunk of gold, it's really hard to tell people not to follow their, their greed, I guess. But yeah. Um, I think that it would also, it's also important to uh, talk about why there, why there was that spirit to go and, and you know, move forward, which goes back to why people came here in the first place from Europe, of course, you know, going to an, a new land. At that time, the West was an, a new undiscovered land. Uh, very few people had seen it, and fewer lived in it. Uh, so it was, it was part of that excitement of, of going out and discovering something I did. Um, I had a lot of sisters, <laughs> which I think is one of the reasons that I ended up being the, the man of the family and the bread earner. Um, and most of them survived into adulthood, I'm happy to say. It was, uh, you know, one of those unfortunate things that uh, some passed away later, but uh, we, all, we all did all right. My, my mom did fine by us, and uh, one of my sisters even wrote a, an, a biography of me. Uh, Helen and uh, lived up in uh, the Cody Ranch with us. So, you know, we, we kept close. We were a close knit family. You know, she never told us what her age was, <laughs> but I could probably do a little bit of math and estimate it. I would guess that she was probably about 35. Yeah. She did not survive. It was a tough life. I'm surprised the rest of us survived, but you know, it's good. Yes. Um, as I understand, there were other routes. Um, there, um, I know that one of them, the, the route that I was following, went through the uh, northern area. I'm, I'm all, I've heard that there is a trail that went down through northern Nevada where Pony Bob Haslam Road. So it seems to me there were a couple of different ways to get there. But we were all assigned to one route, and I just knew the one that I was traveling. Any other questions? We have one more question over here. Well, I can. Um, the uh, shortly, you know, you're all, you're probably all familiar with the Little Bighorn. Custer's death at the Little Bighorn. And uh, shortly after that, I was called back from, I was performing in New York at that time, and the cavalry called me back as a scout. Uh, we went out in 1876 and uh, were confronted by a um, group of Indians led by uh, an Indian chief named Yellowhand. And uh, I talked about the fact that I, you know, knowing Sioux uh, came in handy, and one of the things that he did was to call to us in Sioux, and he called out Pasca, which meant Yellowhand. He was calling me specifically and um, uh, organized the idea that he and I should have a duel between the two of us, um, which was a good thing for me to know because then I, I didn't assume that we were just going to have a big old showdown between his tribe and 
our scouts. So he and I rode forward. Um, we both took shots at each other. He missed. I, my first shot hit him in the leg and actually killed his pony. Wouldn't you know, my uh, cavalry horse was not as reliable as my old Brigham. It stepped in a prairie dog hole and tripped. So now we're both on the ground. He picks up, we're armed with rifles. He picks up his rifle, I pick up mine. We fire again, and he again misses me, and I struck him in the head. Now, some people wondered whether I had gone a, a little uh, extreme in scalping him, which I did. I scalped, not only, I scalped him, I took the, his scalp and his war bonnet and his shield back to New York, and they were. They were there on display when we put on the performance, the first scalp for Custer, which is what it was called. But one of the, one of the soldiers who you would think would be uh, pretty tough by that point actually questioned me about the, the need to scalp him. And I pointed out that um, he had a yellow woman's scalp on his belt, and he was wearing a US flag for a loincloth. So he had obviously killed some soldiers, and I felt that under the circumstances to act in such a way was justified. I probably wouldn't do it today, but that is how I was almost scalped and avoided it by uh, getting my knife out of its sheath before the other man did. Any other questions? Yes? What year did you receive the Medal of Honor? I received that uh, in... I would, I would like to um, tell you that it didn't mean all that much to me in 1892, I believe, is when I received it. But I would like to uh, address that a little bit later, if possible, because it's, it's an interesting subject. Um, I never personally received it, so I will, I will have to, we'll have to clarify that. Any last questions for Buffalo Bill? One more over here. Well, <laughs> go ahead. Man, there are, uh, reports of my death are greatly exaggerated, I hope. But uh, let me uh, just uh, let me call up our friend Sarah, and then we'll make a transition into this uh, much more serious conversation, including the thing about the Medal of Honor. Round of applause to Buffalo Bill Cody. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, oh, oh. So I will now introduce you to the Chautauquan that we have tonight. This is um, Brian Crawl, the very talented Brian Crawl. Um, he is a theater, in addition to being an amazing Chautauqua, he is also a theater director and playwright. And he's actually the author of more than 20 plays. And his script, Paper Lanterns, Paper Cranes, was the recipient of the 2003 Medallion Award as the best new published play in the United States. So. Yeah. I think that deserves an applause right there. That's pretty awesome. Um, now, as a Chautauquan, he has appeared as Captain William Clark. Um, and he's actually done that in front of the Yugoslavian. Oh. oh. It wasn't in front of him. He was dead. Oh, he but was But I, I portrayed the Yugoslavian uh, dictator, oh. Marshal Tito. Yeah, there were some people in the first show who, who were like, really that's impressed. amazing. <laughs> OK. I'm glad we cleared that up. Um, so he plays, appears as Captain William Clark, he, also the Yugoslavian dictator, Marshal Tito. Um, clearly, I need to learn my history a little bit better. Um, and Eugene O'Neill. And at the firehouse, he was previously seen as Howard Hughes. So I'm sure some of you might remember him as Howard Hughes. So now Brian Crawl will answer questions as himself and also help answer some of these other Buffalo Bill Cody well, there were a couple of things that jumped out at me that I just want to catch and clarify. Um, because you mentioned 2017, I think it's interesting to note that this is actually the 100-year anniversary of Buffalo Bill's death. He died in 2017. And um, the, I, I mean, yeah, 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 1917, yes. He, um, I, I explained this afternoon, he sort of bridged uh, two important periods in the United States history. He was born in 1846, which was the beginning of the Mexican-American War, which sort of put America on track to becoming a world power at that point, and died 
as the United States entered World War I in 1917. So he was kind of in, in between there. Now, he did offer to fight during the Spanish-American War. Um, and some people have questioned whether or not he took the name Rough Riders of the World from Teddy Roosevelt. But in fact, Teddy Roosevelt was a fan of Buffalo Bills. And he borrowed the name Rough Riders for his group that went up San Juan Hill. And some of the Rough Riders, there was a small contingent of Rough Riders who performed in Buffalo Bills Wild West after that. Um, the other question was about the Medal of Honor. And um, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. Yes, he was awarded the Medal of Honor, but, was, but it was revoked. Because, uh, not because it, that there was any question about what he had done. And it, it wasn't the fighting with Yellow Hand. It was another skirmish with Indians where he saved a, a number of troops. It was because he was a scout. And that meant he was a civilian not a military person. And the Medal of Honor is only awarded to members of the military. In the 1990s, there was a, a movement uh, which involved a number of different senators and at that time or in congressmen, including Dick Cheney, who argued that uh, Buffalo Bill should receive the Medal of Honor. And he actually did receive it in 1998. But that's not something he could tell you. <laughs> as he's not around. But I, I, just a, a fascinating thing that they actually went back, they looked at the records, the records are there. The records of what happened were there. And, uh, but because he was a civilian at that time, and, there, and he's been one of those figures, you know, that go in and out of popularity much in the same way uh, Custer did. You know, some, well, one day they're a hero and the next day they're a villain, you know, and it just depends on where the, the winds are blowing. But uh, these days, Buffalo Bill, seems to be considered uh, more of a hero for the most part, and for many other reasons, which I, I'd be happy to talk about. But let me answer your questions first. Yes, I see you back there. What's that? Did he ever get touched by the Civil He was. It was an interesting thing. He had made a promise to his mother that he would not fight in the Civil War while she was alive. And she died in 1863, and he joined a Kansas group. He was not a soldier, but he did work as a scout and uh, briefly as a spy for the Union troops. And uh, there is a story that uh, seems too good to be true, but apparently has some merit to it, where um, uh, Buffalo Bill was in the South, dressed in Missouri gray, kind of scouting out where the, um, the uh, Confederate troops were. And he went to a ranch house, and there was a Confederate officer in the ranch house eating buttermilk biscuits and milk. And uh, he suddenly turned and he said, what are you doing here? And then Buffalo Bill said, well, Wild Bill, I'm down here spying for the Union. And it turned out Wild Bill Hickok, according to the story, was also spying for the <laughs> Union at that time. So they sat down and had a nice breakfast together <laughs> before going off to their, uh, you know, individual generals to report their findings. So yes, he, uh, he, mainly, he never uh, fought in any uh, battles as far as anyone has reported, but he did serve in the, um, in the Union Army as a scout. So I guess that answers that. Why am I continuing on? Other questions? OK, so if there are no more questions, I'll just make an explanation of why today Buffalo Bill is held in a little bit more esteem. First of all, just the whole idea that we kind of talked about, the, uh, that he could not have taken credit for at the time. But now historians actually recognize Buffalo Bill as one of the three major influences that drove the uh, Western movement. People who saw his show in the East wanted to go out West. And people in Europe wanted to come to America and experience the West. So just as, as much as Horace Greeley with his Go West Young Man, Buffalo Bill was driving populations of people into the West to settle the frontier. Um, that's one thing. And that's, a, that's a, both a, that has positive and negative parts to it. What I think is purely positive, and I don't, I'm not the authority on this. I found this fascinating. Um, Vine Deloria, 
I don't know how many people are familiar with him. He's an American Indian author who wrote Custer Died for Your Sins. He wrote an essay for the Smithsonian talking about the positive impact Buffalo Bill had had on the Indian tribes, hiring them, paying them a salary. But the thing that really was the, the, uh, the life-changing experience, taking them to meet politicians in Washington, taking them to Europe, experiencing other cultures that they never would have experienced. In this way, he opened up opportunities for Native Americans that they never would have had otherwise. And I just thought it was fascinating that somebody like Vine Deloria, who if you've read any of his work, is a, a radical voice against the treatment of Native Americans by the US government, should come out as a proponent for Custer, I mean for a Cody, I thought was just fascinating. And then, and then other things, like uh, his uh, hiring of women, his, uh, he, uh, he went broke in the last years of his life, investing in something, he had he'd felt he had accomplished something in depicting the West and American Indian. It was very important to him to depict American Indian life at that time. Uh, and so when you saw the show, then you could wander through the village. And the Indians lived in the village, and they prepared their food there. And you, know, you, could, you could see that. And he felt very proud of that. But then in the last years of his life, he actually went broke promoting something called Black America which was to be a, a cavalcade of African-American experiences in America. But he could not find an audience for it. It was one of the reasons that he eventually had to, eventually lost the Wild West exhibition altogether, because he had invested so much money in that project, which never really culminated in it as a success. But, you know, he was, he, um, was very, uh, his group was very divergent. And uh, everybody worked together. It was really, uh, in fact, when they were in New York and there was a, an epidemic going on, he made sure everybody got vaccinated. So in a way, he was even a proponent of modern medical care so that they wouldn't uh, come get sick. So, you know, I, just a, an interesting guy. And, not, and, not only, and he, it wasn't always because he was, you know, so noble. Sometimes it was because he thought, well, maybe there's, a, maybe there's an audience for this. Maybe there's a, a way to promote this. So, yes? Oh, a thousand, <laughs> easily, depending on when you saw it. And it varied from year to year. Uh, over the 30-year period, um, like there's a lot of talk about uh, Custer's last rally and the Little Bighorn. But apparently, it was only seen in nine of the years that they performed. So shows would come and be replaced. Uh, they would bring in uh, uh, other groups of people when he started focusing on international, uh, in, uh, the uh, international horsemen. And there is a funny story, because somebody asked at the afternoon show, well, isn't the buffalo an American bison? And uh, yes, indeed, the, the bison is the correct name for the, what, w what was known then as the American buffalo. And so in the, this is a long-winded explanation, but I'm glad that you asked. The uh, Ripley's actually put out a thing saying, Buffalo Bill never shot a buffalo. And then someone said, I, I saw him. He shot a buffalo. Because when they expanded their show to include horsemen from around the world, they had water buffalo. And one hurt itself, and no one would shoot the poor creature, so Buffalo Bill put it out of its misery. So on that day, Buffalo Bill did shoot a buffalo. So, other questions? Yes, one last question. I'm, I better look up the top too. No, I think we're okay. I think you're it. Um, you know, yeah, it's very possible that uh, he actually um, he claimed he'd been poisoned by his wife, and uh, <laughs> but it could not be proved in court. Uh, he was a heavy drinker. Uh, Chances are he had just reached a point where his body gave up. He got a, he got a cold, was sick for several months, thought he was recuperating, and then passed away. Uh, and uh, the final note about his, his death is the whole question of, well, you know, who's in Grant's tomb? And um, some of you may know that uh, Buffalo Bill wanted to be buried in Cody, Wyoming. But his wife buried him in a rock 
outside Denver, which is called Lookout Mountain. They drilled a big hole in the mountain and put him in there. Now, the explanation seems to be that, again, he was, he left no money, even for his burial at that point. He had no money. It seems as though Louisa had quite a bit of money, because when he would send the money home, she would buy property and put it in her name only. So he couldn't you know, take advantage of any of this uh, property they owned. She was pretty clever. Uh, they went in divorce court. Uh, she won, which meant they stayed married. So, and then after that, he accused her of poisoning him. Um, but uh, the story is that a, a banker who actually owned, had uh, uh, gotten the rights to Buffalo Bill's show because of his debts, offered her enough money for the burial and maybe a little bit of extra money on the side for her future if they could have a big parade in Denver and bury him on Lookout Mountain. Because his bank was in Denver. Um, but there is also the indication that maybe she was just so pissed at him. She just wanted to put him as far away from Cody, Wyoming as possible <laughs> in a rock that he'd never get out from under. So, I don't know. I don't know. Thank you. So thank you again, Brian, for all amazing performance. Thank you all for coming.